Okay, yeah, I think it looks like we're there. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, happy August 22nd, 2020, uh, the year of the plague. <laughs> uh, I'm Mitzi Soretto, <laughs> and I'm here uh, to promote and to discuss the best new true crime stories, small towns. And I'm joined by my contributor, David Brassfield, who's coming to us from the southern USA. Hi, David. Hi, it's good to be here. Ah, well, you're looking cheerful and happy and healthy. It's a good day. It's been a good day. Oh, that's, that's a good you take thing. Them these days. <laughs> <laughs> how are you managing with all the, um, you know, the change in lifestyle? I, I feel like I'm pretty lucky in that um, uh, we're able to uh, do a lot of things. Uh, my kids are able to do school from home and I'm a teacher. I'm going into work and um, I'm about to have kids virtual and in person. So that's going to be challenging, but I have a general plan. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I wish you the best of luck on that. I mean, it's definitely challenging times. And uh, <laughs> but so so hopefully it all go well and you just go in your hazmat suit when you have to deal with the kids. Literally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, anyways, we are here to talk today. Um, David wrote a story called The Voodoo Preacher. Um, uh, it's a quite an interesting story uh, of events from several years ago. Um, first of all, tell us how you're actually connected to this story. Now, this this is a story from your hometown, right? That's right. I'm from, uh, I was born in Alexander City, Alabama, or Alex City. And um, when I was a kid, I, I heard this story. My, my uh, mom was a lawyer, now, now retired, but um, she had connection to another attorney who represented um, this man who was accused of killing uh, several people, his relatives, his first wife, his second wife. He was uh, suspected of killing his brother, his nephew, and his stepdaughter. And uh, there's mentions of other other people. And um, uh, so um, he eventually he couldn't he had a great lawyer and he stayed out of jail and people said that it was because of his ties to voodoo he was the voodoo preacher and, and the law couldn't touch him wow and, they, and honestly they never did so so this was the story that you 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 make a reference in in the story that you wrote that uh this was a, a case discussed around the supper table when you were a kid that's right and um there was even a woman who worked Okay, so let me just backtrack. So he, he was defended successfully uh, many times uh, by his lawyer, whose name was Tom Radney. And um, uh, so they, they had a big problem determining cause of death. And at the same time, he was collecting a lot of accidental death insurance on all of the alleged victims. Um, as his lawyer said, uh, a homicide is an accident to the person who got killed. And so therefore, <laughs> like he could collect. Um, back then, uh, I'm sure maybe the, uh, that the rules have changed in terms of that now, but he, he was able to exploit that loophole. And um, so uh, he eventually, uh, the uncle of the last victim was a 16-year-old girl who was found positioned beneath a car where it had uh, made to look like she was changing a tire and it, and it had fallen on her. And of course, no one believed that due to his history and the fact that people don't change tires by going up under the car and uh, having it <laughs> land on them. And um, so um, the girl's uncle uh, at her funeral, um, at the end of the service, as everyone was leaving, uh, there was a relative of hers, another young girl, stood up, turned around to, to the reverend, the man who was suspected of doing all this, and said, you killed my sister and you're going to pay for it. And then her uncle stood up and pulled a pistol out of his pocket and shot shot the reverend three times in the head. And he said, uh, "You're you've, you're done uh, hurting my family." And then he was he was then brought into custody and he was defended by Tom Radney, the same man who had defended the man he had just killed. Uh, and so my mother drove by. We lived down the street from the funeral home where that happened, and everybody would ran out of the funeral home when it happened. And uh, she was wondering what. Well, I wonder what's going on there and only found out later uh, what had actually happened. And there was a, a woman who'd worked to our, uh, with our family who said, um, oh, wow, I almost went to that funeral. I thought they were going to kill him at the cemetery. So it seemed like it was, <laughs> at least from, from her point of view, it was known that this 
guy was gonna gonna get it. He was gonna get his uh, come up at the vigilante uh, justice, as I said, or lynch mob justice, is the way the prosecutor put it when uh, when the uh, Reverend's assassin went to trial. Wow, so that's pretty close to home then. Uh, it was right there. Yeah, <laughs> I mean How everything in Alex City is pretty close. You go down the street and then you come back, and and there it is. <laughs> you know, it's there's not much. There, I went back recently. I, I my, my parents divorced when I was young and we moved to Montgomery and uh, I went back and, and uh, saw a friend there and uh, we just picked up like we were friends, just like when we were little kids. And uh, he drove me around and it was like, here's where this was and here's where that was and there's where that was. And it was all right there. <laughs> it's just all right and right together. Wow. Wow. Was this was this something that you really thought about much as a kid or is it more a case that you revisited as your as a as an adult? It was those things that I was fascinated by at the time. And I think it planted a little seed and uh, and I forgot about it. And I also knew about Tom Radney, who ha would, I had met him once, I think, as a child and didn't remember much. But I remembered my sister saying one time that she found a hundred dollar bill. And I thought, wow, you found a hundred dollars. That would seem like a million dollars back then. <laughs> and she goes, well, I had to give it back uh, because the, I saw who dropped it. And, and it was Tom Radney, the, the lawyer. And I was thinking, <laughs> he has hundred dollar bills falling out of his pocket. He must be <laughs> just completely loaded. And uh, yeah, and now you know why. <laughs> well, the, interestingly enough, he bought his own office building and um, uh, they called it the Maxwell House after Reverend Maxwell. Everybody in town said his office building was the Maxwell House. And he told me in an interview uh, back in, I think, 2007, he goes, I probably didn't make enough money to buy it So with, with his, that insurance money. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. Um, give us a bit of an overview. Just um, I, you, you referenced it earlier about the Reverend. Now, this, this is Reverend Maxwell um, and a uh, small town preacher, so to speak. Um, and so so this was I mean, someone who's killing several people, you would sort of say is a serial killer. But this was really an insurance scam, right? Absolutely. Yes. And um, so. The uh, I guess, interestingly, that first the first wife was found beaten and strangled in her car in August of 1970, I think, and um, they they charged him, and because uh, they there were holes in his alibi, and uh, they uh, he wasn't where he said he was, and um, they had a witness who who had you know said that he wasn't you know where he he said he was. Well, when it comes time to go to trial, the witness who was this next door neighbor woman changed her story and said, actually gave, gave him an alibi. And uh, not long after that, they were married. And uh, so the Reverend married the witness against him and the cases, the, the case was dropped. And not long after that, she met a similar fate and she too was found dead in her car on a highway alongside the highway. And so uh, the lawyer, uh, Tom Radney would collect an insurance for him, and uh, apparently a lot of different cases. There's and there's other books that detail all the different um, uh, uh, insurance. You know how much they think he he got. They don't know for sure how much he collected, but it seemed to be quite a bit. Um, and the attorney told me he split that money with him fifty fifty. That was the deal uh, on every on every one of them. And uh, he's quoted in my interview with him as, as saying, you know, the fifty fifty the same. So basically, basically they were partners. Uh, when it came down to it. Now, he said um, he said that he believed him. He said, I believe that the Reverend was innocent when he said, said he would always believe my client. Um, but then he also said after the, the fourth victim, when, and actually the fifth victim, when, when the young girl died, he said, that, that's it, Reverend. I, I can't defend you anymore. Like those first four murders, you may be, or they're alleged, you know, those first four deaths, I was with you, but I, I'm out now. And so he said he didn't defend her. He didn't defend him or uh, do that later. And there's questions about uh, whether any insurance money was collected on hers and if whether he did that for the Reverend's third wife. Uh, and that's an open question. Yeah, I mean, you know, one insurance, you know, one one accident and an insurance claim, fine. But one again and again and again of all these relatives, I mean, weren't the police sort of saying this, this is really a bit beyond the bounds of reality. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I don't think anyone believed it. It's just a matter of, um, you know, after, after the first one, the one was beaten, strangled afterwards, it looked more like suffocation, but they couldn't prove it. There was uh, the second wife, um, the Radney kind of 
maneuvered to have it uh, in front of a favorable judge and a different like a little different county that where where the things taking place where it was going to near in several different counties uh and where they would be more likely to be favorable and anti-insurance company and uh they um they they kind of got the got the um, the toxicologist or, or whoever who was on stand who was on the stand to say that it could have been you know this uh, I think it was a bronchial infection or something that was aggravated by the accident. So the accident triggered some unknown cause that had, she had never shown before. And that that was the, therefore it was an accident and they bought it and he uh, made a deal with the insurance company and collected on that one too. And so um, it seemed a lot of, there just weren't, weren't ways to prove back then, you know, that, that there was actually a murder that took place. Now for the last, the young girl who was found under the car, right after it was too late to do anything about it after the reverend was killed they did say yes he's that this is definitely a homicide so who knows what would have happened if uh if robert burns the girl's uncle hadn't have taken matters into his own hands but yeah it sounds, it's, it's, it sounds like he could have just kept going on and on until there were no relatives left <laughs> oh imagine being i mean i'm not family. making light of it i mean it's this is pretty awful stuff but it's just uh, it's 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 almost crazy that uh, did he he actually thought he was just going to keep on going and going and going doing and, this and imagine the family thinking he is just keeps getting he keeps doing it what were they thinking i mean where you know they were who was going to be next who was you know who could be you're basically being hunted based on you know whatever whatever the whims and how much insurance he can get on you yeah and plus just, plus the next wives it's like do you really want to marry this guy well interestingly enough the third <laughs> wife was also arrested for uh for the murder of, in charge at the murder of the first wife and uh the charges were dropped that she was the woman who she was who they the police said that she was with uh, that he was with the night, uh, or instead of at the revival, they said earlier in the evening he was with her, and um, so there was some suspicion about her. And um, even after after the the it was her adopted daughter that was killed, and there was an interview um, by the local newspaper, the Alexander City Outlet, and um, they uh, when when you read the interview from back then in seven it was seventy seven by then um she kind of was like it just wasn't she just wasn't the same girl she used to be she wouldn't help around the house and, and it's like oh, oh. <laughs> so how, how much did That's you okay you then know, right yeah i mean she, she still said that everyone was innocent and that you know just because you're accused of one thing doesn't mean you did everything but um it doesn't mean you didn't and that isn't the strongest you know defense there so how so how many people was he actually known to have killed well, he was he wasn't proven in the court of law for any oh, okay. of them, but he was suspected of uh, at least five. There was um, the the second wife that there was the witness that he later married. There's talk of uh, that uh, she had a husband who who was had health issues and that he had died around that time, and that um, uh, you know that uh, there was a lot of suspicion later on that uh, maybe maybe the reverend had been bringing him his morning coffee every day. And that they put antifreeze or, or something or formaldehyde or something like that in into it, uh, into the coffee. So there was there was talk at least, but there's you know it's a small town. There's lots of talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of a, lots of gossip in small towns. Oh my God. Um, so as far as uh, so so you actually um, uh, you you actually did uh, get to talk face to face with his attorney. Um, now he's a, he's no longer with us, right? He passed away not that long ago. He did. I think I might be getting the dates wrong, but I, I talked to him in I think 2007 or eight. It was uh, in July of one of those years. I can't remember which. And um, I think it might be in in uh, in the in the book. Um, but um, uh, I, I've lost it on, on right now. Um, so I did talk to him and I went to his office. I, I reached out to him. So I had read, sort of rediscovered the story going back to what you had asked me originally. And I was in grad school. I was uh, working on creative writing and um, a professor was like, uh, who's your favorite Southern writer? I'm from Alabama. It was a natural question, but I just was like, I have anxiety and I just drew a blank and couldn't think of anybody. I couldn't <laughs> think of any of the people that I had read, you know, Faulkner or Flannery O'Connor, nobody came to mind. I just 
spat out the first person I had had read recently, which was I had finally gotten around to reading To Kill a Mockingbird. I had gone my whole life without reading it until I was in my late twenties, and uh, so I, and he kind of looked at me like, yeah, really? <laughs> and um, and I'm, I think I remember in my mind, I'm like, I don't know all of the books that he's read, written, and because I really didn't know anything about Harper Lee at the time. Um, so I went and researched it later that day. I have to see how big of a fool I had made of myself. And, um, and it turns out it was a pretty big, I was, it was really a big fool that I had made out of myself. But uh, I also found online at the computer lab where I was doing the research, the story about the Reverend and, and Harper Lee going to research the story of the Reverend to write a book to follow up to Kill a Mockingbird. And I was like, I know this story. I remember it. And I went immediately and called my mom and I was like, do you remember this story? And, and she told me, she reminded me uh, of what, uh, what the woman Doris had told, uh, told us about um, almost going to the funeral and um, on that you need to talk to Tom Radney. And so I look, looked him up and reached out to him and he was like, yeah, come on down. And I uh, went down to his law office and I sat there and I got him to, that's probably the longest interview he ever did on this. And even at the end, I was still like, because I've never done this before. I'm a, I have a fiction background. I don't do nonfiction. And I was like, what can, what else do I need to ask? And, and eventually he was getting his secretary to try to come in and try to shoo me away. <laughs> and I'm still trying to think, I'm like, I was just oblivious, thinking, what do, I, what do I do? So, but anyway, I accumulated all of this, this interview and, and some others, and I accumulated all this research that I would eventually use, you know, all these years later. Wow, that's pretty cool. Now, now you reference Harper Lee, who, um, if people aren't aware, she won the Pulitzer Prize for To Kill a Mockingbird. And um, there's been a lot of um, spin on this about the Harper Lee connection, but but you actually did communicate with Harper Lee, and, and she sort of kind of poo-pooed the whole thing, saying, yeah, I, I was looking into this, but uh, let's Nothing. see. Uh, here it is. Here's the. This is what her that she sent me, and it says, uh, "Dear Mr. Brassfield, uh, when I was in Alexander City all those years ago, I found a mountain of rumors and and tall stories to a molehill of fact. T uh, I trust that time has settled Reverend Maxwell's dust, and I wish you well. Wow. Sincerely, Harper Lee. That's and, incredible. Uh, yeah. So, I'll, and this was I got this in early uh, January two thousand nine. And I was like, wow, Harper Lee responded to me. I can't believe it because uh, I had just sort of gambled that I could uh, reach out to her uh, sister, who was the oldest thing, oldest practicing attorney in the state of Alabama at the time. And I just sent it care of care of her and she responded. And then at the same time, I was like, but where's you got to give me more than that. Come on, Harper <laughs> Lee. <laughs> if you're not going to write the book, come on, help help somebody out here. And um that what that letter did is I found out later that it mirrored a longer, much longer, more detailed letter that she had sent back in 1988 to another uh, Georgia writer named uh, Madison Jones. That many may have heard of um, in which she it was a, a really fascinating letter in which she talked uh, about the case and she kind of dropped all these tantalizing details and, and mysteries and at the same time warned him away from doing it. And you will uh, talked about the human vanity. Everybody wanted to be on t when's it going to be on tv or when's it going to be when's the movie coming out you know that was what every everybody wanted to know and talked about tom radney specifically and said um if uh said you better verify everything he says because uh and uh, if a hero is what you want invent one because they're in this story there aren't there aren't heroes um so she was essentially saying that the, that whole andy warhol's 15 minutes of fame was running rampant in alex city on this case yeah, absolutely. And and so, uh, yeah, some, one of the um, the reverend's relatives had reached out to her and wanted her to come do it and was like, oh, I'm going to get like he could do everything in the publishing industry. I'm going to get this published like like it was Harper Lee. <laughs> you know, she could do it if she wants to. And uh, she took that to mean that he was wanting money. And she was like, I'm not going to do that. So um, and it turns out when Max, uh, I'm sorry, when Radney, when I talked to Radney, he said that he had he goes, I have a, a file this thick and Harper Lee has it. She, she may have burned it. And I was like, well, well, can you call and ask for me? <laughs> and he goes, she'd probably tell me to go to hell or tell you to go to hell. And I'm like, well, what if we wrote a letter? You know, <laughs> I was like, and he was like, no, she's not going to do that. And, um, and of course I did write a letter and she did respond. Um, um however, briefly. But, well, maybe, um, maybe she'd had enough of Radney. <laughs> 
Yeah, he's apparently he called her every year, and she he told he said she'd always um, said she was working on. Oh, I'm still working on it, uh, uh, Tom. I'm gonna get that out by Christmas, and then uh, so like she might have stalled him for a while. But it turns out that that uh, that it came out later in the last year that he really that she really did have his files and, and some of his stuff. So she just she just didn't decide to pursue it. I for. She well, there's didn't. a lot of theories about that. There's a lot of people that said that she didn't want to write a something that was all going to be about an indictment of the insurance uh, industry, and that um, others said that you know when you write the best book in the world, the only way to go is straight down. That was um, <laughs> uh, was what, uh, another famous quote, and um, also uh, she apparently told Robert Burns, the man who who ended up killing uh, a Reverend Maxwell. That it would be, um, it would, it would be, it would implicate other people in in town, and she didn't want to do that. Um, and so, that, that, so those are the different major theories that have been floated. Wow, wow, yeah, you know that must be a, a real well, not to make light of it, a, a cross to bear. I mean, you get a Pulitzer Prize for this book that they are still talking about all these years later, and it's just. Well, yeah, but you're a writer. You're supposed to write. You, this is what we do. And then to I'll think imagine. that, well, whatever I put out isn't going to be nearly as good. Why should I bother? <laughs> I know. Imagine though, how what it would. I imagine write, reading a book by Harper Lee on this. I would have loved to have been able to read that. It would have just. I wouldn't have had to. I wouldn't have pursued it. I guess because I would have just known. But uh, it would have been nice. I think everybody yeah. would like. That, that's just amazing. Um, so actually, um, you wrote a book about the uh, the Reverend Ma Maxwell case some years ago, right? The sort of definitive. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it definitive. So. Well, I'll call I, it definitive. I, I definitely would. <laughs> there's two books that I'm associated with. Uh, this is the the one that I wrote many years ago in 2012, and then this one here. And I don't know if you can read that. Um, but so, and that came out last year. Um, the first book, so it was right around the time I was interviewing Rodney and, and I was going back and forth from Atlanta to back to Alex City. And I was an assistant teacher making $12,000 a year, driving a 20 year old car and I had a baby daughter at home. And it, I was like, and I wouldn't get any information. Harper Lee wasn't co cooperating, <laughs> obviously. And there were other people who were like, you know, I always thought I was going to write that book and other people didn't want to talk. And I think a lot of people thought, well, this is Harper Lee's story, which, you know, I get that. And so I thought, well, you know, this is just, this is the universe telling me that I'm, I'm not a nonfiction writer. I'm, a, I'm a, just going to do fiction. And so I wrote that first book, uh, which I called The Reverend. It's been, uh, it was described as pulpy, <laughs> which I think is fair. <laughs> um, and I, uh, because I just wanted to finish a book I wanted to do, I used what I had and then I just made up stuff around it. And then, uh, later, um, I was never satisfied with that. And then, um, I had this other opportunity to, uh, to do this one, uh, to be involved in this book. So, uh, that's what I did. And you actually wrote them. So people are going to Google David Brassfield. They're not going to find those books. You actually wrote them under uh, a, a, you, a, you branded them as a different author's name. Just to confuse everybody. Yeah, you I, did uh, confuse everybody. I'm not a promotional guy, obviously. <laughs> I, I go to christomar.com um, and uh, that would be, that gives the story of the uh, blood cries uh, if you're interested. Oh, that sounds rather interesting. So you blood cries is like a story within a story. There is a story within a story. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of stories within the story, and that, wow. that that'll you know give the the whole thing. Yeah. I, so, so I mean, you mentioned the being from a fiction background, and then suddenly uh, diving into nonfiction, and 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 you know, we were saying in the green room before we went live about how much work it is actually doing nonfiction and doing true crime because there's just so much. Uh, burden on us to to get the facts right and you know have everything accurate I, I think yeah and for me yeah I, I published two stories this year and one of them was this and the other one was magical re uh, you know a story about that's from the magical realism uh, you know from the South American influence and so they're totally completely different um, uh, and it, they're both I think they're difficult in different ways uh, for me, I had done so much research and accumulated so much that it wasn't as difficult, I think, because I had done all of the work ahead of time, not re realizing that I would even use it. 
And so um, that helped. <laughs> I think that made it a lot easier to write this piece that I had not intended to write. And I just sort of stumbled to, stumbled across the uh, call for submissions. And I thought, oh, this looks like fun. I can do this. I have all the information. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so that was helpful. And I, and I had, I kept all, I'm a pack rat. I kept all my research and I would just go back, just look everything up. And I had all, I had all of it. So uh, that, that was very helpful. Oh, that's cool. And a lot of information has come out in the last, in the recent, you know, the last five, 10 years. So that, uh, what that didn't exist when I started or well, wasn't available to me when I started. That's the thing with, with nonfiction and true crime. I mean, it, there, there really never is an end to a story. I mean, even if you do a historical piece, some things could come out later on. So it's like a continually evolving process. You know, I mean, the story I wrote, I mean, I was, I thought I was done with it. And then I happened to see that there was another uh, court case and another, you know, so I'm like, oh no, I got to hurry up and get that in. And then you know, <laughs> by the time it's out, it's like, well, maybe there's something else going on. So it's sort of just as a, like this octopus that the, yeah, it kind of reminds me of <laughs> it reminds me of uh, in cold blood you know the Truman Capote wait had to wait for the end of his book to happen because he had to wait for his main characters to, to be executed uh, <laughs> yeah 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 that's I, I what recently a tough, watched what a, the and film. it destroyed him they said so yeah that was that was pretty horrific i mean uh, the film that was on with um with that that gentleman the actor who I think he committed suicide. I, I'm, I can't remember his name, just a wonderful actor. But I mean, that really was amazing oh, no. about that. I mean, you know, how it really, that case did destroy Capote, turned him to alcoholism and he just, you know, went down. Yeah, and it's, ama it's, an, a very, it's an amazing book. And yeah. your piece was amazing too. I was really thinking when I was reading it, I was in, the, in just the book in general, because I've been back and forth about true crime because I'm not a true crime writer. It's not my background. And, uh, and I always felt like, am I, am I doing this? Is this right? You know, what am I doing here? And then um, in a, is it exploitative? Am I, am I doing that? Or what is this? And, but I really realized, and I think it was when I was reading your piece that it hit home that it really points out like systemic problems. And I was thinking in your, you're in your piece about uh, mental health issues. And I was thinking about, what really hit me so hard in that was the um, the police officer who had who had reached you had a mentally ill brother and had you know really wanted to help this guy and then she ends up getting killed because she's forced to play the part of a mental health advocate when she's a, a policeman you know and it's uh, uh, it was very sad and I thought moving so. Well, thanks. Yeah, I should have someone interview me about my story or interview myself. <laughs> <laughs> But Everybody yeah, well, I mean, when I'm when I'm looking for stories too, it's like when when something actually uh, sheds a light on on a problem in society or society or, or or a fault that could easily be changed. I mean, there's two pieces in the in the book about how uh, you, on gun violence and how countries have nipped that in the bud and said, okay, you know, we don't want people going off and just shooting people all over the place you know we need to do something about it and i i you know i would like to hope it's people it'll give some people food for thought especially people in the united states <laughs> yeah and i think i think i think you, your book shines a light on that and it, it really does and that's why i think it's important uh, because i think it really does highlight things that we need to work on <laughs> we need to do better yeah, and see how other places do it. I mean, I I, I had an interview recently, and and the uh, interview interviewer was saying that they were he was really surprised about all the non-American stories that there were all these other countries in the book. And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, I I want to have a really international book because my outlook is international, and we we do have other countries. It's not just one country in the entire world here, and and I think it's important to kind of see cases from other parts of the world and what's going on and and as i said how how issues are addressed or perhaps not addressed and i i think true crime can serve a purpose and and uh do some good in that regard not just exploit you know we're trying to be Absolutely. really careful not to I, and i agree and i think that's what this book does and i think um and that was another fascinating thing to me about the book too was that it was so representative of you know um of all these different countries and uh, you know i didn't know australia was considered the serial killer capital of the world i think is, is what it is one of the one of the pieces says i never you know so much that i didn't know uh that i found interesting 
Yeah, sort of that big frontier. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's just it's, yeah, a lot of things were just real surprises. You know, getting in a piece from Trinidad and Tobago, I'm like, well, that's really, you know, I never expected that. And from someone who's there and, you know, dealing with life there. And so, but yeah, I mean, I think that's the whole thing about trying to put a really big perspective on it, not a small perspective. And you know, have some social responsibility. You know, I mean, I, I know sometimes there's people who are maybe are very critical of true crime and I, that's been in my mind. I don't want to put out some kind of book that um, you're thinking you're just sort of uh, walking over the bodies and trying yeah. to, you know. Yeah. Well, I think you succeeded. Oh, thanks, thanks. Um, one last question I, I wanted to mention. Um, since your book is called The Voodoo Preacher, without giving everything away, what's this voodoo? What, what's this got to do with our, our reverend? Um, well, it, it's a small town, and mostly it was the, it was the rumors that were coming out that, um, you know, he, he must be protected by voodoo when there was talk of uh, chickens, headless chickens hanging from trees and blood on doorways and uh, uh, safety, I don't know, safety pins and e not safety pins, but... Um, what do you call those little web uh, like for the for the dolls thing yeah, yeah well they had that there was talk of uh jars of uh from formaldehyde or jars of things that had uh love and hate and things that were found in his <laughs> home and um uh harper lee said um you know if you she didn't really believe that there was any and that if that uh, all those rumors could be traced back to a single source and um the source that i traced it back to was Radney for one who told this long story about going to New Orleans to trace back the voodoo powder that he found uh and how he went to the voodoo shop like I guess the voodoo shop in New Orleans <laughs> <laughs> and that they told him you know he, that this is oh this is voodoo powder we know we know the guy who did this and that everybody told him it was voodoo all he goes all my black friends said it was voodoo oh it's voodoo that killed him but um his also he also um had a I had a, a, a list of his stated aphorism, things that he always said. And one of them was, if you don't know the truth, make it up. And uh, oh. he, was known, he was known for that. And uh, I think the other, uh, the other um, only other place that I found that where it was traced back to anybody was to the Reverend's own family. So it seemed like the rumors traced back to, to them themselves. And I think maybe it had to do with warning people away from him and, uh, hmm. you know, making sure that people continue to, when they saw him walking, to walk to, to, uh, across to the other side of the street um, and to uh, everybody to go inside when he drove by, leave the porch and go back inside when he drove by because the Reverend's a voodoo man. Wow. Okay. That's bizarre. Um, so, is it, um, so we're several years away from when this all happened. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming there's still some people alive. <laughs> well, he didn't kill everybody. So he still has some family members still there. Uh, yeah, and it's, uh, I went to Alex City with the last book and um, his, his uh, daughter came and just seems really kind of bewildered by all the attention and like, all you know, uh, why is everybody, you know, kind of interested in this? And she came in and she left and she came in and we were like, hi, <laughs> how's it going? So, you know, uh, but she just seemed, you know, very uncomfortable. And I, I think they're in a tough position. I, you know, I really feel for the family who, who had, uh, you know, I would imagine, you know, I even looked into some of the Facebook posts where they, people seem to be dis arguing whether he was innocent or not. People want to believe him. Half of them say, no, he, he was guilty. And I think it's, he really drove, you know, he destroyed the family. He drove us, you know, this schism through the entire family uh, that, you know, will last for however long. Yeah. And then of course, being in a small town, it's, it's just amplified. It's not like you could get lost in like Manhattan or Los Angeles. It's just it's a small little town. Yeah, and everybody knows. I mean, yeah, we're, you know, when I talk to, you know, I would go to courthouses and dig around in the basement and they're like, oh yeah, I knew him. I'll tell the story about, about the black cat that was found in the first, uh, in the, in the, at the car of the, one of the victims. And, you know, I was like, that may have been where the voodoo rumor started or, you know, or may have been just made up or thought up after the fact. Um, but yeah, every, everybody knew him back then. Anybody who's still around, you know, cause everybody knows everybody. 
Wow, wow. I, you know, I suppose that would be the the um, an issue when you're doing this kind of work, um, and you you're speaking to people, and people have their own stories, and then maybe those stories get embellished, and it's like, well, how you know, you have to sift through what's actually fact and what isn't fact, or are you just going to say, well, my book might be true and it may not be true? Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think you just got to have to go with what what you can verify, and yeah. what uh, what you know for sure. What what you can prove. Wow. Well, um, just to wrap up, uh, is there anything you're working on right now you'd like to kind of mention or something you're really excited about? I'm a, I'm a teacher, so I'm focusing on on that. That's really all my creative energy because this is such a crazy year. And because, yeah. um, but I, I have it before uh, we got back into school, I was working on a science fiction story. I, I just like to, I like to move between genres. And so I was excited about that, but it's not ready. So it's just going to be in the drawer for a little while. And I had a novel that's kind of a, um, I don't know how to describe it, but I have another novel that's more of a comic novel that um, I've been working on for years and years. And I've, I'll, I usually work on it a little bit every year. Um, <laughs> and so, and then there's a, a horror novel. I always have some different things that, I, that are going on and it just depends. And I kind of have ADD. So uh, if I can uh, focus on one and get one knocked out this year, that would be great. <laughs> I kind of empathize because I mean, uh, although I mean, I get like involved with the true crime and it's it's a real time sucker. But I mean, I think I have ADD too. I mean, and 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 you know, the the internet's really made that bad. It's like, I, I mean, yeah, absolutely. See what and happened I, I, on Facebook, or what's the tweet, or or do I have an email? And it's it's just like, yeah, you're just bouncing around like this ping pong ball. And and then I'll pop into my head. I should write another. This was a fun nonfiction piece. I'm going to write more nonfiction. I have an idea. And then it'll be like, well, and I write so slowly. I'm really generally incredibly slow writer. So uh, it, it's, um, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm pretty slow too. I'm very deliberative. You know, it's like like a, each precious word goes on the page. Well, I'm, I'm not precious about my book, but I mean, as you know, when I hear about people, like, well, I knocked out, you know, 2000 words today. I'm like, really but then again those 2000 words maybe once they've edited are only 200 because the other is not worth anything well that's how i am i knock out 2000 words and then the next day eliminate 1900 of them because they're no good <laughs> <laughs> yeah well if I, if I put down 200 words there's probably 200 words that are going to stay there they're they're going to they, they were pretty good words you know? that's good that's it reminds me of Kurt, oh Kurt, you know Kurt it takes Vaughan a long time to write like something that. if you're <laughs> Well, um, anyways, for those of us, uh, those of us, we're already here. Those of you who have been watching, I've been talking with David Brassfield, who ha has written The Voodoo Preacher in The Best New True Crime Stories, Small Towns. And it's been great talking to you. And I'm so glad you were able to join me today. And I really wish you good luck with uh, <laughs> the teaching. Thank you. It's been great talking to you, uh, too. And I wish you luck with this book. It's a, it's a good book. Everybody Thanks. should uh, check it out. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.